joining us on the blue couch today i'm rifil wemohorosi is a internal auditor at absa group how are you doing today i'm well thank you how are you dear i'm good thank you no complaints um thank you again for making time um for us on the blue couch i'm sure like you know the insights that you're going to share is going to be valuable um for students especially um those who wish to go into the financial services sector which you are obviously like a fundi at now you know the terrain <laughs> um <laughs> yeah okay yeah, so thanks um, for having you... me yeah um <laughs> okay um so can you tell us a bit about uh who do you feel we is you know um who are you as a person um you could also maybe touch a bit about on your journey as a student you know how you ended up studying what you did and you know how you ended up getting into your um profession Okay so sure. that's always a, a big question because you don't really know where to start about who the feeling is um mm. but really um currently like you said I'm a internal audit manager at Absa and I focus a lot in the um commercial banking space um uh, but before that I am yeah I went to North Coast High School went to UJ uh quite introverted but really enjoy getting involved with a lot of things Um yeah so that's just in terms of school but um if i just zone in specifically on my journey as a student i think that would be beneficial mm-hmm. um like i said i went to uj and i studied a bcom accounting uh did my honors in internal audit and honestly university was one of the best times of my life um maybe because the the studying part was secondary to a lot mm-hmm. of students activity and um i was just i really feel that my my student journey was balanced and holistic so i had the the academic side which really was about getting the degree in record time and making sure you know that i have the degree there were no hopes or no dreams of getting distinctions or anything like that but really just applying myself um and on that journey um i did start out wanting to go the ca route but as i progressed i saw that that's not necessarily something that i wanted to do um mm-hmm. and then on the other side i was part of like the res life and i think that was very helpful in my student journey because it exposed me to a lot of different things and a lot of opportunities in terms of um applying new skills learning new skills like presentation for instance learning how to work budgets and things like that so i think from my student journey perspective it was very balanced and holistic and you know wholesome for the most part yeah 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 if i can just um sort of maybe pick up on the the ca part so um so my perception of scholars at least you know who are interested in financial services um is that people want to study accounting so you know you'll meet someone who think they good at numbers or whatever and they'll be like you know I want to study accounting and it's almost like you know that's like the only profession that exists in the universe um for scholars in relation to financial services and i suppose you know there's also like the perception that accountants make a lot of money which obviously everyone wants to do <laughs> um but do you think that um i suppose maybe there's a two part here so the, the first thing is do you think that that is a general problem that we have that the only sort of exposure people do have to anything in financial services is accounting maybe a bit of businessman and economics because those are also subjects you can do at school level mm-hmm. um but then also like in in your experience as being a first year and a second year for instance do you find that most people come in there thinking they're going to be accountants and then actually you know they realize it's so much more um that you can do with just maybe one degree or you can maybe segue into another major or what have you yeah um look so it, it actually starts in high school with career fairs and that sort of thing where you are introduced to the concept of CASA and that being the dream and like you said if you get this designation you're going to make lots of money and you'll be like mm-hmm. an accountant as soon as you walk in people respect you and you hear that from high school days so and really become accounting is something that's punted as the option mm-hmm. um and 
generally at school, if you're good at maths and good at accounting, then it just almost made sense for you to move into that field. For me personally, I didn't even consider something like um, economics or bizman. It was really like, I'm good at this numbers thing. I'm good at accounting. Mm. I'm going to be a CA. And that was really the only exposure I had. And that was the same as first and second year. Um, I was still on that TA stream. I didn't consider any other majors or any other subjects that I was doing as, you know, an alternative or to move into economics or anything like that. I was very focused on the TA stream um, until I realized I don't like tax. And I think that's, <laughs> that's one of the things that we don't really talk about at that high school first year level is that um, a CA is a designation, it's a qualification. It is not necessary, it's not a career path. It mm -hmm. opens up a lot of career options for you. Um, but we, we seem to just associate that with accounting. And what you do find is that a lot of CAs are not even accountants. Um, mm. They go into audits, they go into IT governance, they go into so many different fields because it is a designation, it's not a career path. I don't know if I've answered your question. Maybe I've yeah. answered the first part only. <laughs> no, no, I think um, you've definitely answered it well. Um, so if I were, so if I was the scholar who's, who's good at maths and accounting, let's just assume, I don't know, I could be something else, even like a mathematician or whatever. Um, if I then go in and I do a BCom accounting, I then still have the option to go the other routes, right? So I suppose not so much actuarial sciences because that would mean I need to go the BSc route, right? So that's something completely yeah. different. But yes, there are yeah. other things that I could do. Um, so I could do audit or tax or just accounting, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay. and those three areas are so different anyways. So like I said, I enjoyed math. I was good at math in high school. I'm now an auditor. I don't look at numbers. And people mm. assume that I look at numbers. I don't balance books. That is not what I do. I look at um, organizing, well, the um, APSA end to end from things like how they execute strategy to petty cash to HR policies to the different product offerings that they have. So I don't think that I was very clear about what a BCom accounting would open me up to. I assumed it would be math. And I think that that's the same for a lot of people. Tax is also completely different to auditing, but all of those things are grouped into this, this degree and you think you're gonna come out as an accountant. Yeah. yeah, sure. So um, maybe we can talk a bit then about uh, being an auditor. Um, so you've touched a bit on, you know, what you do as an auditor. Um, could you maybe tell us, you know, what it is that you like about being an auditor that is perhaps different from, you know, being an accountant or, or, or tax practitioner? Um, and also what the difference is between um, an internal auditor and an external auditor? Okay. Um, I think, let me start with the differences between an internal and external auditor. Uh, generally, both of these people do not uh, like balance books or work with numbers. That's really mm -hmm. more in the accounting space. Um, external auditors, let's work, uh, let's speak from an EPSA perspective. They do not work for EPSA. They work for an external firm that's appointed by the shareholders of EFSA, and then they will confirm that what we're reporting is accurate, complete, and all of that from a financial perspective. Sometimes they will look at the controls, which are the, the processes in place to ensure that those numbers are accurate, and that is what external audit does. That's where you'll hear things like um, it's an unqualified report or qualified report and those sort of things that's in the external audit space. Whereas with internal audits, we actually work for our organizations um, and we're an independent function from management. So we don't execute any processes in selling anything or buying anything or anything like that. What we are there for is to assess whether the processes within the business are effective, whether they're adequate to mitigate against risk. We, so we essentially we are providing assurance on the work that management is doing from a risk mm -hmm. perspective. 
Uh, we also look at the governance structures and whether those are effective in dispensing their duties. We look at internal controls. So that's really what we do. And I think the reason that I really enjoy it is I get to interact with people at various levels of the organization in different parts of the organization. So as much as every audit is the same in terms of process, I'm continuously learning about different things. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, if I think about my degree, I studied accounting, auditing, tax and financial management. Um, but now I'm in a space where I'm assessing whether a strategy makes sense. And mm -hmm. that's not anything I feel that you can really study for, but it's continuous learning. Um, yeah, it, it really, it really stretches me. And the most rewarding part is, yes, it gets very hectic and people fight issues that you raise. But when you see management actually implementing or changing some of their processes based on your report, and it mm. saves them money or it saves them time. It's it's a great feeling. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Yeah. So um, how would you then be different from someone like a compliance officer? Or is that more or less the same function? That's a good question because <laughs> that's basically a question we asked a lot. Um, because mm. I think when you're on the other side of an audit or compliance um, type review, it feels the same, it feels that we ask the same questions and that sort of thing. But if I think about our compliance uh, teams, a lot of what they do is driven by a regulation or a law and they test mm -hmm. against that. Um, and sometimes in some organizations, your compliance officers actually take on risk and they make decisions for the business. Whereas we're independent and we mm -hmm. really look at policy, we look at best practice, we look at legislation, we look at a whole lot of things uh, in assessing the risk for this for an organization. Yeah. Sure. Sounds like a very dynamic <laughs> occupation. <laughs> um, so I want to ask you a bit um, about your study. So you've um, obviously done your master's in MCOM, right? Um, and I remember- That's the info. Info. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You, um, you did your topic on um, the role of auditors, right? But it was internal or external? It was internal. Internal. Okay. Yeah. So um, do you feel like, um, you know, your master sort of helped you to get ahead in your career? Or do you feel like, you know, you there hasn't been like really any difference from before you started to, um, you know, after you finished your degree? Um, what I will say in terms of getting ahead, I think I, so while I was doing my master's, I actually was promoted into the manager role. Whether it was just the master's, I don't think it was just the master's, but mm -hmm. I think when my team looked at the fact that I want to progress in my career and I'm committed to internal audits and furthering my education, it's an indicator of someone that can move up in terms of leadership roles. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what the postgrad did for me. Um, in terms of my day-to-day -day work, I wouldn't say that <laughs> much has changed, but what I do say is that I have developed a research skill which has mm. enhanced the way that I'm able to find information. I'm able to find information more efficiently. And yeah, so, and that helps when you are looking at organizations and risks and controls, yeah. Mm. Okay, so um, you, you obviously then had some work experience going into your master's. Um, yeah. Do you think it would have made a difference if you went straight from honors to master's without that sort of gap in, you know, of work experience? Uh, yes, um, because a lot, of, a lot of what, for instance, if I think about my, my um, topic, I would mm -hmm. only have seen that after practically seeing what internal auditors are meant to do and whether what we do is effective or, or not. And in the context of a corporate failure and that you, I really think that you can really have an insightful or yeah, an insightful master's journey when you do have some experience backing you, because you can reference that. I mean, one of the subjects that we looked at was project management. 
I think coming out of varsity, uh, coming out of my honors straight into masters, it would have just been another tick box exercise. But that was mm. something that I could really think about and say, okay, when I manage an audit, this is how I can, this is what I can implement. And also when I'm auditing projects, this is the criteria that I can use. So it just it just made it more practical. It it helped in terms of the sort of questions you, I could ask and the sort of insights that I could get from the course. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm glad I didn't go straight to the masters. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, in terms of the topic you chose, um, you would have also then only be able to have come to that topic, um, you know, based yes. on your, your work experience. So you yeah. did sort of like a real life, um, a real life topic. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, then uh, just sticking to your your journey a bit. So um, obviously on your master's journey, you know, you sort of said that what you learned was relevant because you had the work experience and now you could, um, you know, sort of apply the theory to practice. Um, but in terms of like coming out of your honors degree, do you feel like, you know, like what you learned was relevant? I suppose it's a bit of a, a weird question, you know, because you're not like a humanities person. You know, because humanities, you don't, you don't get any real like, okay, I can balance a book now type of skill, right? It's sort of, it's yeah. more like critical thinking. Um, but you guys get something that's a bit more relevant, you know, you can say like, I have this particular skill. So do you feel like what you had learned in your undergrad and your honours um, was useful when you sort of worked or you walked into the workplace? Or did you find that there was still sort of like a lot that you had to learn or like a big learning curve um, to go along. Ah, okay, so um, I think that the undergrad and the honors certainly opened the door for me to move into internal audit. Um, and you get the, you learn the principles of like how an audit works and end to end. So it equips you like that. And it equips you to a certain level, the sort of questions you should be asking and a certain level of thinking, um, mm -hmm. definitely. But in terms of me being able to hit the ground running, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, like you mentioned something about humanities that I found interesting is that it teaches you that critical thinking. And for me, and even through the research that I've done, that's a key skill for an internal auditor is that ability to connect the dots, think beyond what you're seeing, be skeptical, negotiate, mm -hmm. stakeholder management, those sort of things I did. Sorry, DJ, I did not learn from the degree, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I learned from, you know, practical, practical work. Yeah. Um, I think because of the, the role that we play, if you move into an environment that's not necessarily mature and that appreciates audits and, you know, um, getting audit issues, one of the big things is your resilience because there's a lot of back and forth with the client and lots of like disagreements, even though you present the, the, the evidence and that sort of thing. And that's for me is something that was a shock for me because I'm like, I'm trying to help you, you know, and they yeah. told me if I do it, follow this three-step process, you'll get it. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, yeah it, it doesn't work like that in the real world. And I, I suppose there isn't really a degree that can prepare you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, do you find the, the same problem with like new graduates coming into the workplaces that, you know, maybe, you know, they get this shock, you know, I don't know what shock to call it. It's not a culture shock, but <laughs> a work shock, <laughs> maybe, right? Um, where, you know, they just, you know, the learning curve is just so big. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I have seen that. And I, I think it is, I think maybe even the way that a young graduate is perceived when you walk into an organization and you're asking this experienced individual to show me like how you do it and then you question how they do it. I mean, you they, they get pushed back like that and you're so young, how can you even mm. think to ask me that question? So there's that also that you need to adjust to when you're a young um, graduate coming in. Um, and again, it's back to that, the books tell you that there's this three-step process and mm. it doesn't exist when you are <laughs> doing the work. Yeah. Um, and I think that skill of being skeptical of the information that you get and then being able to articulate that without 
breaking your relationship with the client is yeah. not something that you get as a young graduate yeah mm -hmm. and yeah. that's obviously not something that graduates are taught unfortunately <laughs> oh we, need to be, we need to be taught that yeah yeah so yeah. um so based on your experience now as like a um experienced hire i don't know what else to to call people like us yeah. in the middle of <laughs> in, is it mid-career professionals yeah um if i were a, a student studying accounting or auditing or whatever right now you know what what would you sort of um what sort of advice would you give me you know to sort of like prepare myself for you know those other things that maybe what's in the books is not going to help me um you know in a, or like how i could better prepare myself for that um i think definitely it is getting involved in the the professional bodies that govern your career mm -hmm. um i think getting exposure to those sort of for instance with internal audit it's the iia getting exposure and being a member of that and um, reading the magazines and going to the events, it helps because you can see what, what is happening in the industry, what is happening with the career. And mm -hmm. you, you, you get a better feel of what to expect when you do, you know, eventually move into corporate. Um, and research, spend time reading and mm -hmm not necessarily just reading about topics in your degree because again that's going to give you a three-step approach on how to do an audit or how yeah. to balance the book but look at your soft skills develop that while you're still in varsity you don't need to wait until you get to to the office so when we speak about um presentation skills that is really helpful in understanding how to deliver your message sharpen that skill sharpen your negotiation skills go to courses and learn different skills um, and not just the, the technical knowledge, but just soft skills are really critical and develop that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Valuable, <laughs> valuable advice there. Um, so then just, you know, going through your journey as a student, I suppose you now have two parts to your journey. So you have your undergrad and your honors um, and then you have your master's. Um, if you look back on those two journeys, is there anything, you know, you feel you could have done differently? Okay. Um, I'll start with the masters. Um, I think once I, I enjoyed the journey, but one thing that I would have done differently is, okay, two things. Um, mm -hmm. I applied myself in each of the courses even more, uh, gotten more out of it, um, mm -hmm. especially the ones that I wasn't comfortable with. So if I, I was comfortable, for instance, with audit, and you know I could do well there, but project management, I, it wasn't something I was comfortable in, and I focused on not being able to do it as opposed to just really embracing that that process. And then the second thing is creating solid networks um, mm. through the masters. I, I I I didn't do that, and it's the same thing with the undergrad and the honors is. I was so focused on doing the work that mm -hmm. I missed out on the opportunity to network and create a network. Um, yeah, create a network through that process, um, which is something that's very valuable. It is a small community and with limited opportunity, well, not limited, but yeah, limited opportunities <laughs> to, there's only so many spots at the top, for instance. And yeah. Um, when you do create those networks you open up more avenues and more opportunities to move around and to to get to the top i suppose you know yeah um and then from an undergrad or honors perspective it is similar to that i i i actually only got involved with the iia like two years into my career um mm. and i think that i lost out on an opportunity to form relationships from a student perspective and to be better prepared for for corporate um so that that would be the thing that i would say that i wish i would have done then otherwise i was very happy with yeah. <laughs> my my student life and career yeah 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 so i just i just want to um ask you also just about your experience in the private sector i mean people always say it's so competitive cutthroat you know it's 
you know, trample or be trampled on? <laughs> like, what is your sort of experience, you know, um, as like a, as a black woman, you know, as a young mm-hmm. person, you also um, spoke a bit about, you know, your experiences of, of being a young person and asking questions and people saying, who are you? You know, who do you <laughs> think you are? Um, like, how have you sort of navigated the space? Um, and I suppose I also want to ask, maybe this should be the first question is like, what does the space look like um, for you, you know, and like, has it changed, you know, are you like the only person or the only woman or, um, you know, are there groups of people, you know, where you can find support or are you like that? How do you say someone sticks out? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That makes it a bit more difficult, right. To, um, to be sort of like in, in the environment. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, sure. Okay, I'll start by saying my corporate experience has been a little different um, to, yeah, my lived experience is different to what people expect. Um, I've never felt like the first and only, you know, black person, woman, young person that's moving into an area. And I think that's just because I've been blessed with really good managers. And this thing that um, women are vicious in corporate and that sort of thing, I have not experienced it myself. And all of, pretty much all of my managers have been women, young and old, and they've actually opened doors for me um, to, to you know, climb the ladder. They've given me exposure beyond my experience and beyond my qualifications and that sort of thing. So I will say that. In terms of what, and okay, what I can say is, In corporate, you find a lot of the support functions like audit, like risk, like HR are female a lot and people of color, yeah. And whereas the business areas and the people that are making money for the bank don't necessarily reflect what the support looks like. And that also comes with its own complexities Mm. Um, because as, I think culturally as a young black female, even walking into a room, I'm already looking down, you know, making myself smaller. So that's that's a me thing. And I don't know if it's a corporate thing. And mm. engaging with older people, um, for instance, calling you Odile was a big deal for me. And mm. I think that those sort of cultural things almost not hold us back, but Corporate is not designed for that. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's not designed for us to be meek and humble. It's designed for us to walk into the room, take up space, and that's how you notice. And yeah, so balancing that ha- was difficult and being aware of it, more and more aware of it now as I'm climbing, because now the, the color of the room starts to change as well. Mm. Um, and knowing that, you know what? I got here on merit and I can express myself and they listen because I know that I can express myself. Mm. Um, but again, it's not everyone's lived experience. So you say that, you know, you now find people actually listening to you. Is that something that's always been your experience or do you think that, you know, perhaps because you're now better known in the industry and in your organization, people are actually aware with you of your um, experience. So you sort of build up that okay, the perception, you know, that, that um, refuel is competent, right? Um, as opposed to, you know, what, what we've seen, what op- often happens with black women when you walk, work in, walk into the workplace is, you know, you don't get that immediate assumption, okay, you know, this person sort of knows how to, to do their job, um, you know, that others may get. Oh, no, so I definitely had to build up my, um, how do I say? My reputation first. That's um, the word, reputation. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that was lots of hard work and diligence and, yeah, and extra hours and saying yes to everything and all of that. And maybe other people don't need to do that, but I found myself doing it. And it, I think, one thing that my boss told me. Um, because I asked him, he's pretty young and he's now the head of audit for CIB. And he said, just put your hand up for the jobs that other people are not willing to do. 
that's how he got to where he is. And when you look at him, you don't necessarily think that he's had to do that. Mm. Um, and when I reflect on my career, I've been doing that anyways. And that's why people sort of trust me is because when things need to get done, it gets done. Um, but the, the, the flip side of that is you focus so much on your career and building this reputation and not making mistakes that I have not taken really big risks in my career. And possibly that has helped me back in terms of where I could be now. Um, and that's also just because in our environment as probably yes, as a black woman, I, there is no room for mistake. And whether that is something that's self-imposed or imposed by people that look like me or imposed by corporate, I, I don't know, but really there's, there's no room for error. No, yeah. I, there can't be like a chink in your arm or anything like that. You have to always perform and it's good and bad. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, I have definitely the no room for error is something I've experienced <laughs> as well. You know, especially with students, you know, um, students can be can be very hard on you, you know. So if there's like a little mistake in the study guide or whatever, you know, it's like sure. a big issue. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's definitely, you know, something that's maybe a little bit universal. Um, but I also just want to ask you as um, you know, someone who is uh, you know, like how I would describe you, you know, like you're not like the loudest person in the room. Um, you know, you're always waiting for your turn to talk. Um, so as someone like as someone like that, how have you sort of built up your networks and you know done those things that are so critical in the workplace or that I would say corporate environments and many other environments, which honestly is like designed for extroverts, you know, for the first person mm -hmm. to put up their hand and or to interject, you know, and talk over other people. Um, you know, how have you sort of managed that terrain? Um, you know, I, I suppose beyond your work, um, which is you building that credibility, you know, just in terms of your conduct as an individual, um, you know, what has been some of the strategies that you've employed? <laughs> no, I have not employed any strategies. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. No. Oh my goodness. Well, I think up until maybe a year or two ago, I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, I have sat back and waited my turn and waited for someone to, you know, identify something in me um, and say, okay, that girl's really smart. I've seen her work. So really, I, I waited for my work to speak for me, mm -hmm. um, and never. So there's one thing in raising your hand to do things, and there's another thing in, in speaking about the things that you've done. Mm -hmm. And that's a skill that I have not mastered as yet. And I didn't do it for the early part of my career. And if I think about it, I was doing things that were beyond what I needed to do, um, but I never ever spoke about it. Um, and I never networked because I was too busy doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe the strategies that I use now is that I've realized that I have to speak about the work that I'm doing. Um, and then I have to work with a team as opposed to me doing it by myself. Um, because when you do it by yourself, no one knows. They just see all of a sudden, oh, wow, there's a new report, but <laughs> they don't know yeah. where it came from or things like that. So, um, yeah. And I think the 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 disadvantage to that, to, to being quiet and to waiting your turn is that I was in an organization for about nine years operating at manager level, but I was never seen as, yes, I would get the really good feedback that, you know, you're doing such a great job, but when it's time for promotions, it didn't happen for me because I didn't say it loud enough that that's what I wanted. Um, and something that just popped into my mind as I'm speaking is, when you are navigating corporate, you actually have to be intentional. And I haven't been intentional until, like I said, two years ago. Because what happens is, especially when you're a good performer, is that your managers will then almost dictate what your career is. Mm -hmm. um, so before I moved into audit, I was in business as a um, relationship analyst. 
Um, and my managers were so happy and they had this career path for me. I was going to be a branch banker. Then I was going to come mm. back and have a portfolio. And it sounded great. And you get like, you're like, wow, they see this thing in me. But I know yeah. it's not my nature. I yeah. know I don't want to be a salesperson. I don't want to manage a portfolio. That's not what I want. Um, but, and because I had that self-awareness, then I was able to make sure I navigate into audit. But without being intentional, I could be doing something that I really don't enjoy, but excel at. So it's, yeah. I think the strategy is maybe deciding where you want to be and how you want to be there and finding out what you enjoy and what you are good at. And sometimes those things are different and then making the decision when you chart your career, whether you go with what you're good at and what you enjoy and what is more fulfilling for you. Mm. Sure. My goodness, powerful. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if we were if we were good at all the stuff we, we enjoy doing? Like we enjoy world, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The world would be such a simple place. Yeah. Yeah. So um yeah. just um as a last parting shot, um do you have like any advice, you know, to to students or um to maybe early career graduates? or just to women in general, you know, coming into the financial um, services sector, is there any piece of profound advice that you have maybe been given or that you've now come to realize, you know, that you, you wish, you know, if I just knew this thing, um, you know, before going in? Um, the first thing is no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to chart your career for you. It's not oh, no. going to happen. You need to be <laughs> intentional. <laughs> yeah. And you need, and even if you don't know where you want to be or what you want to do, just try something. Don't let other people recognize things in you because you're going to end up on a path that you don't necessarily want. Um, and always, always, always try to be prepared. Mm whether it is reading that newspaper article or whatever the case is, different courses or whatever, expose yourself to different things so that when you walk into a room, you don't default to the culture of a woman is to be seen and not heard. I think that also comes from this, from us not feeling that we know each other, know enough. Mm -hmm. and, and, but if you get in front there, you can, you know, walk into a room and take up that space yeah and yeah. don't be afraid to take risks great things happen from mistakes yeah yeah, yeah. preparedness meeting opportunity right <laughs> all right well thank you so exactly. much for joining <laughs> us it was it was really fun talking to you um i've learned so much myself about just i don't know is it what is it called the accounting profession or the finance profession what do you call yourself as a collective the herd <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's call it let's call it the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's gender it's yeah, it's it was really insightful. Um your job actually sounds so interesting now. I realize now that I had no idea um what you did every day. So <laughs> that was really interesting for me. And yes, um all the best going forward. Cool, thank you so much. And all the best with the blue couch. <laughs> <laughs>